a few days ago in one of my lectures I explained that we are aspiring for the divine love of Sri Radha Krishna. We are all here on this intensive because bhakti, devotion is our goal. We're all striving for bhakti. There is one bhakti that we have to do known as sadhana bhakti or divine love devotion. And when we perfect that sadhana bhakti or divine love devotion, then we qualify for Siddha Bhakti, which is an intrinsic power of God that we receive upon total heart purification with the grace of our Guru. So there is one Bhakti that we have to practice and then when our practice is completed, then we receive the ultimate, absolute, divine bhakti, that swarupa shakti, parashakti, divine bhakti. Rupa Goswami Ji and his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu has described that there are a few conditions that need to be fulfilled on the path of devotion that one has to abide by. So he describes Anya Bhila Shita Shunyam Jnana Karma Dhyanavritam Anukulyena Krishna Anu Shilaram Bhakti Ruttama the first condition is that devotion should be done without any worldly desires, including the desire for liberation. The second is that devotion should be done without the hindrance of karma, yoga, jnan, austerities, ritualistic practices, etc. Bhakti is independent of karma and jnana. The third is that we should not love God as Almighty God, but we should love God and His loving form as Sri Krishna with five bhavs, the five relational feelings that a, an aspirant can have with Sri Krishna. There is yet another condition that has to be fulfilled, and this condition is the very foundation which supports the palace of devotion. And that condition is ananyata, or steadfast devotion, also known as exclusive devotion. In our past uncountable lifetimes, we have practiced devotion. It is an obvious fact, but we must strive for exclusive devotion. God wants us to love him and him alone. This is why the Vedas and various scriptures in our Sanatana Dharma have laid emphasis on loving God alone. In the Gita, Sri Krishna describes Tameva Sharanam Gacha Sarva Bhavena Bharata Eva. The word Eva has been used. Eva means it denotes only, alone. 
मेकमे शरण आत्मादेना भागवत मे प्रपद्यंते माया मेता तरंति ते एव so this word ananyata has come in our scriptures ananyata anya means others so by adding na it becomes a negative means it becomes ananya means not others meaning exclusive this word ananya has been has come shri krishna has described in the gita ananya shintayanto mam ye janah paryupasate tesham nitya bhiyukta nam yogakshemam mahamyaham the gita is filled with love and surrender to god Although Arjun loved Shri Krishna and he was surrendered to him to Shri Krishna but Shri Krishna told Arjun to be exclusively surrendered to him Shaadhi maam twam prapannam Shaadhi maam what to do my lord Arjun says Shaadhi maam what to do my lord twam prapannam i am fully surrendered to you yet when shri krishna tells arjun to fight the war to fight the battle he refuses to fight the battle because he is afraid of killing his own relations his own elders his kinsmen so he refuses to fight the war this means that arjun is surrendered to shri krishna arjun loves shri krishna but he does not love shri krishna alone he doesn't only love shri krishna in other words arjun is not exclusively surrendered to shri krishna this is how the gita started on this note arjun is he also loved his status prestige elders relations kinsmen so he was not fully surrendered to shri krishna not exclusively surrendered and this was shri krishna's instruction to arjun Narad ji in his Narad Bhakti Darshan describes anya shrayanam tyago nanyata means giving up hope of all except one is ananyata is exclusiveness anya ashrayo ka govind radhe मन ते त्याग अनन्यता बता दे निज सब बल तजी गोविंद राधे निरबल बनी बल हरि को बना दे when draupadi was being dragged into the assembly by dushasan to be stripped of her clothes she was faced with a very dreadful situation only the heart of the experiencer can understand how terrible such an act of injustice was for a woman for an indian woman of her status and respectability draupadi So Draupadi thought that I what have I to worry about I have five husbands Yudhishthir Bhimsen Arjun Nakul and Sahadev I have nothing to fear they will protect me but because they had lost her in 
as a result of gambling. They just kept quiet. They just kept sitting. And so the hope that they would protect her left her heart. Then she looked to the wise men of the court, Bhishma Pitamaha, Dronacharya, Kripacharya, but they also kept sitting quietly. They did not protect her. So the hope that they would protect her also left her heart. Then she looked around to see if there was anyone else that could protect her. But there wasn't anyone. No one showed interest. So Draupadi thought, I will protect myself. So she clenched her sari between her teeth. What was the power of a woman, a powerless woman like Draupadi against Dushasan, who had the strength of 10,000 elephants? Sri Krishna was in Dwarika at that time eating his meal. He had one morsel of food in his mouth. And he was holding a morsel of food in his hand, which he neither put on the plate nor in his mouth. His eyes were open and unblinking. So when Rukmani saw this unusual state of Sri Krishna, she asked, what, what is the matter? So Sri Krishna said, there is a serious situation. And one of my devotees is in trouble. So the Rukmani said, then why then go protect that devotee? So Sri Krishna said that I have said this many times. Ananyashantayanto maam ye janaha paryupasate te sham nitya bhiyuktanam yogakshemam vaham yaham. That I take full responsibility of the devotee who fully, wholeheartedly surrenders to me. And this devotee, her faith at this time is her in her own strength. So, Dushasan, as soon as he pulled Draupadi Sari, it was jerked loose. And in that very moment, Draupadi, she abandoned her, the, the faith of her own strength and wholeheartedly cried out to Sri Krishna, Ha Nath Dwarika Vasan, O oh, Dwarika Vasan. Sri Krishna, please save me. As soon as she became Ananya, as soon as she became exclusive, Shri Krishna immediately appeared, instantly Shri Krishna appeared and took the form of a sari that the form of an endless sari that the Shasan kept pulling until he gave up. This is ananyata, exclusiveness. In the Ramayan, it is described, Ek bharoso, ek bal, ek as vishwas. Rely on God alone. He is your only refuge, your only strength, and your only hope. So the word is ananyata, not anya, not others. Who are others? anyone and everyone apart from God. These include worldly people, celestial gods and goddesses. We, the problem is that we, although we say Twameva Mata Chapita Twameva Twameva Bandush Chasakha Twameva Twameva Vidya Dravinam Twameva Twameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva. Although we say it vocally, you alone, the word Eva comes in this verse, 
if means alone you alone are my father you alone are my mother you alone are my everything however what's in our heart is you are my everything yet i have a mother at home i have a father at home so the feeling in our heart is not twam eva it is twamapi also yes you are mine you are also mine not you alone are mine so now we understand that exclusiveness or ananyata means wholehearted single minded dedication of our heart and mind to god and god alone but we cannot love god we can love a dissension of god we can love a specific form of god it is described in the bhagavatam avatara hya sankhe ya avatara hya sankhe ya hare sattva nidher dvija that god has descended on this earth innumerable times and innumerable forms and we should understand that every dissension of god is indivisible divine and complete the question then arises as to what is the necessity to determine which dissension or which form of god would be most desirable for us to meditate upon well from experience we know that our mind not only desires a form our mind desires a form that is beautiful and attractive taking this into consideration the forms of bhagwan ram and shri krishna are the easiest to meditate upon if anyone decides to meditate on a and on a dissension of god for example varaha avatar when god descended as a divine boar then he would conceive in his meditation a material boar which he would not find very pleasing so thinking about the dissensions of bhagwan ram and shri krishna we know we have heard that the avatar of shri krishna revealed the sweetest and the most blissful leelas and his leelas are numerous many many and in the beginning a devotee will not be able to continuously do remembrance or meditate on the form of god which means that he will have to take the help of the leelas and the shri krishna's leelas are so sweet gratifying pacifying that they so easily attract the heart and mind of anyone and everyone and during shri krishna's avatar all the leelas that were performed pertain to the five loving emotions bhavs as i have described in my earlier lecture shant bhav dasya bhav sakhya bhav vatsalya bhav and madhurya bhav moreover the ras or the nectar of divine love in the form of the divine leelas of shri krishna that were revealed during his ascension were not revealed during the ascension of bhagwan ram because the aim of bhagwan ram's ascension was to establish religion and righteousness the purpose of shri krishna's ascension was to distribute the nectar of divine love and this is why 
the saints that became God realized during the dissension period of Bhagwan Ram, they chose to come back as gopis to receive the bliss of Krishna love. So from the point of view of experiencing the highest bliss and the ease of practice, devotion to the all-beautiful, all-loving form of Sri Krishna, who is the stealer of the hearts of the gopis, who is the crown jewel of all the rustic saints. It is appropriate. And the same absolute Brahma appears in two forms. Purnatam Purshottam Brahma appears in two forms as it is described in the Upanishads. Yeyam Radha Yascha Krishno Rasabdhir Dehe Naikaha Kridanartham Dvidhabhut. That the same absolute Brahma manifests himself in two forms, Radha and Krishna. Radha and Krishna are one, yet they appear in two forms for the sake of Leelas. Their Leelas are divine and they are eternal. That is why Sri Maharaj has described Radha Krishna Yato Radha Krishna Govinda Radhe Ek Thay Hai Rahenge Bhi Bata De Kintu Li Lahit Govinda Radhe Do Thay Hai Rahenge bhi bata de. So they appear in two forms for the sake of Leela. Radhaji is the soul of Sri Krishna, the life of Sri Krishna, Atma to Radhika Tasya, Hareha Sarveshwari, Krishna Pranadhi Devi. So Sri Radha Krishna are the sweetest form and the most pleasing and the most attractive form of God that we can meditate upon. The question, however, is how can we, how should we worship them? How can we love them? Shri Krishna described in the Gita, Tesha Nitya Bhyuktanam. We must constantly Nitya Abhyukta attach our mind in them at all times. Constantly be attached to them with our mind. Sarveshu Kaleshu Mamanu Smara. Remember me at all times, Sri Krishna said, told Arjun. When we perform any work in the world, we know that the conjunction of our mind is necessary. We need to have our mind, the attention of our mind and the sense organs. Without the conjunction of our mind, our sense organs cannot perform their respective functions. That is why if we're deeply engrossed in doing something, whether it's playing or reading or watching TV, and if somebody calls out our name, we're unable to hear it. So the association of the mind is important. This means that we can do one of two things. We can either go about our business in the world and perform our duties and responsibilities and whatever we have to do in the world, 
or we can engage or attach our mind to God. How can we do both? How is it possible to do both? Yet Sri Krishna tells Arjun in the Gita, Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu ma manusmara yudhya cha, Arjun. Perform the action of fighting the battle and keep your mind attached in me at all times. This is what Sri Krishna told Arjun. So the question for us is how are we going to do our work in the world and at the same time keep our mind attached in God? Well, the answer to this is easier than we can imagine. You see, every, all kinds of work, all kinds of actions that we perform fall into two categories, and we perform both of these kinds of actions. We can try to understand through an example. Let's say that there is a wife awaiting the arrival of her husband who had gone abroad on a business trip for a year. She plans a special welcome for him, spends hours cleaning the house, and prepares a special meal for him. She performs all of these works, all of these actions with great joy and great pleasure as she's quite attached to her husband. When her husband finally arrives, she naturally wishes to spend time with her husband. So she instructs the servant to prepare a variety of delicacies for dinner. Now observe the reaction of the servant. He regrets the arrival of his master <laughs> since it means more work for him. Although the wife and the servant both prepared the food, they both prepared dinner, outwardly their actions appear exactly the same. What they did was the same, yet in reality it is totally different. When the wife prepared the meal or the dinner, she prepared that meal with great joy. In other words, her mind was attached to the work that she did. While in the case of the servant, his mind, though at work, was detached. There was a complete difference in the attitude of both. When the wife prepared the meal, her mind was attached. She did it with joy and pleasure and enthusiasm. While the servant, he simply did the work as part of his duty. So it is, no, it is not harmful for a devotee to live in the world provided that he does not allow the world to enter his mind. A snake, for example, can only be dangerous for as long as he possesses the poisonous fangs. And as soon as the fangs, the moment they're removed, it can no longer harm anyone. So in the same way, if we perform actions when we perform actions, if actions are performed with the mind attached, only then they can be binding. The binding quality of, a, of any action does not lie in its mere performance, but in the motive or desire that prompts it. So when actions are performed without the desire for any reward or any fruit, then uh, the inevitable result is that the action cannot empower us. It will not be considered a binding action and would be referred to 
as a state of inactivity or doing nothing. Take another example. If a camera is loaded with plain white paper, ordinary white paper, it will produce no impressions. Similarly, a mind filled with attachments, a mind filled with attachments produces impressions on it based on their desires. It produces impressions on it based on the desires. And such desires, they thicken the veil of maya that prevent the divine feelings from entering our heart and mind. So our scriptures tell us that we should perform actions with our mind detached, with the understanding that they are simply our a duty that we have to perform, with the attachment of our mind centered on God. But the question is, how are we going to perform actions or our duties without the attachment of the mind? You'll be surprised to know that most were already in the habit of working in this way. 90% of our actions are performed in a detached manner. The series of detached actions begin right from the moment we wake up in the morning. When we wake up in the morning, let's say if we wake up at 6 o'clock, we don't wish to leave our nice, cozy bed, but we do anyway because our intellect reasons that if we won't, then we would certainly be late for work. So we get out of bed and start the morning rituals, such as brushing teeth, taking a shower, etc. Now, please note that all of these actions are being performed in a detached manner. Even when we go to work, the work that we perform is also performed in a detached manner. How many office workers feel passionate about those files and those meetings that keep them occupied all day? Most workers will agree that the most enjoyable, enjoyable part of the day is the lunch break and the coffee break. Take another example. A nurse in a maternity ward in the hospital she helps to bring hundreds of babies in the world. She helps to deliver hundreds of babies, but she doesn't get attached to any of them. If a child is born healthy, she congratulates the parents. If the child is born, is, if something goes wrong, then she offers her th sympathy. She doesn't get attached. She is neutral, detached and indifferent, simply doing her duty. So although her mind is engaged, she, her mind is really detached. Take another example, a bank cashier accepts and parts with hundreds of dollars almost every day, thousands of dollars almost every day, but he is unconcerned. However, if he is forced to donate even a small percentage of his salary to a cause, he feels the pinch. But if he receives even a small unexpected raise in his salary, he feels thrilled. 
So this uninterested attitude that we adopt toward many of our actions throughout the day in our life, if we can do the same thing, adopt the same attitude toward the restricted circle of people that engage our mind, then there would be no obstacle, no difficulty in attaining God. Just as we are detached from most of our actions, we're also detached from most of the people in the world. Our attachment is reserved for a handful of people, our parents, wife, husband, spouse, children, sister, brother. But with the rest of the world, with the rest of the people, we only behave politely and formally. So if we can reduce the ties of the attachment, even to with these few people that engage our mind, then we can attain God with no effort at all. Moreover, the fact is, it's an experienced fact, that not there's no one in the world that desires our love only. Can you think of anyone that would still love you if you don't favor them? Probably not. Even in the case of a husband and wife, it depends on mutual consideration for each other. Fulfillment of selfish motives is the definition of all worldly love. But someone may raise an objection. Someone may argue that if we don't love people in the world, if we don't have love, then we would not be able to fulfill our duties. We would not be able to perform our actions properly and diligently. The fact, however, is that we can only carry out our duties properly when our mind is neutral. When our mind is devoid of feelings of love and hate. Just like a judge, he can be impartial to either parties if he is neutral, if he is indifferent. But if he develops love or animosity or hate for either party, then he cannot pass an impartial judgment. A surgeon refuses to do surgery on his wife, whereas he performs the most delicate surgery on uh, anyone other than a family member, a close family member, with the greatest of ease and confidence. Because he has an attachment to that family member, to his wife, whereas with the rest of the patients, they're just his patients. He doesn't have any personal relationship with them. Normally, we are under the impression that a mother takes the best care of her child because no one can love the child more than the mother does. But the love of a mother often blinds her to the true welfare of her own child. The tender heart of the mother is easily moved when her child persistently cries for something. She lets him eat candy and chocolate when, he's, when he has been forbidden by the doctor. He, she lets him play outside and watch TV when he's supposed to be studying. 
the mother spoils the child without realizing it. But if a nurse or a caretaker or a babysitter was, were employed to do the same job, then the child's welfare would be taken care of so much better. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that when our mind is neutral, in other words, it's free from both feelings of love and hate, then only we can carry out our duties properly and uh, our judgment would also be impartial. Just like the compass on a ship, it always points towards the north regardless of the direction in which this ship is sailing. So our goal is the same. Our goal should be to center our mind on God, regardless of the duties that we have to perform in the world. We're back to the same question again. How are we going to do it? Tesham nitya bhiyukta nam. How are we going to do it? In order to constantly attach our mind to God, we will have to practice devotion. Devotion. The goal of devotion is to engage and gross, absorb our mind in God, in Sri Radha Krishna. Yena kena prakarena manaha krishna nibeshayet. There are many different kinds of practices, many different channels, means of engaging our mind in God. Although none of these activities are devotion, are known as devotion, because devotion is done with the mind. It is internal. These are all physical. All these activities are simply the means of helping us evolve our feelings of love and affinity and attachment to God. So how are we going to practice that devotion? Our scriptures tell us, saints tell us, that by finding a quiet corner in our house where there is no distraction, where our mind wouldn't wander, we don't have to go into the forest or f go find a cave anywhere to do this. Just a quiet place in the house as it helps the wanderings of the mind. Just like a lamp, it starts flickering in an open, windy place, but it burns steadily in a calm and quiet place. So our mind is like that lamp. Sri Maharaji has given us an example, an analogy to help us engage our mind in God. So Sri Maharaji tells us that our mind can be compared with to milk and this world to water. When water is mixed with the milk, the milk loses its identity. It cannot be restored to its pure state. However, when the same milk is turned into butter, then it can no longer face the danger from water. You could put so much water on that butter and it will always keep that pure state. In the same way, 
our mind in the form of milk is forever being threatened by this world in the form of water. What we need to do is turn or make the mind into butter so that instead of being contaminated by the world, it will instead rise above it. So what is the process of making butter? Well, first we boil the milk and make the yogurt from that milk. Set it aside in a place, in a quiet place, undisturbed. And when it turns into butter, into yogurt rather, then that yogurt is churned again and again until it turns into, until we get butter from it. So this is the traditional way of making butter. And this is the process we should follow in order to keep our mind from becoming contaminated by the world. So what are we going to do to arrive at this stage? There's a process. What are we going to do? What do we have to do? So we have to practice meditation we have to do rup dhyan the loving remembrance of sri radha krishna rup dhyan is the very core of our devotional practice it is the very essence of our devotional practice in fact our devotional progress is at the mercy of Rupa Dhyan. All of us have heard so many lectures, this intensive lectures from the lotus lips of Sri Maharaji. And even otherwise, all the knowledge, all the philosophy, all the theory, the devotional knowledge that has been bestowed upon us by Sri Maharaji. It all culminates in this one, one practice, Rup Dhyan. Loving remembrance of Sri Radha Krishna. This is why Bhagavan Vedavyaji described Alodya Sarva Shastrani Vicharya Chapuna Puna. Idamekam sunnishpannam dhyeyo narayano harihi. I have churned the darshan shastras again and again. And what has been achieved from that? The verdict? Dhyeyo narayano harihi. Remember. Meditate upon, think about the divine form of Sri Radha Krishna. So how are we going to do it? I'm not going to go into any, any kind of detail because we've already heard through the other lectures. But in essence, bring the form of Sri Radha Krishna in front of us. And abandon all of those negative feelings that we have in our heart and mind as individuals. That craftiness, cunningness, artfulness, deceitfulness, whatever we have hosted in our heart, we do as individuals. And with a passionate heart, full of intense yearning and longing, call out to them on the basis of their divine names, on the basis of their virtues and their lilas. Call out to them. Sri Maharaji tells us that this is the medicine 
when we humbly, like a, with a childlike, innocent heart, with that naive, simple, loving heart, just like a child, with no demands from our side, just a simple, loving heart, and we call out to them, it melts their heart. Their tender, loving, extremely affectionate heart of Sri Radha Krishna, also it melts. In the words of Sri Maharaji, Darde dil itna pasand aya use. Darde dil itna pasand aya use. Maine jab ki ah usne ki wah. My beloved Sri Radha Krishna, they so much appreciated the pining of my heart that when I took long sighs, they remarked, well done. Good job. That's great. When I said, ah, they said, wah. They're so extremely easy to please. A few tears, a few tears. When our heart melts in their loving remembrance with that feeling of yearning and longing, it melts their heart. And they come. Without any delay, they come running to us. But they hold back because they realize that our surrender, our call, as humble as it may be, is not yet perfect. We have to work at it. So, remembrance of Sri Radha Krishna doing that Rupa Dhyan, remembering them lovingly, affectionately, faithfully, with a sincere heart, a humble heart, feeling oneself as destitute, helpless, hopeless, realizing our situation. With those feelings, when we reach out to them, but when they're in front of us, the feeling in our heart should be that conviction, that faith, that they are really and truly in front of me in their divine glory, in their true divine form. This feeling in our heart will induce that grace of Sri Radha Krishna. There's a story in this regard. I have shared it in the past, but it's one of my favorites, so I'm going to share it again. There is once a devotee. He was worshiping Sri Krishna, but he had a desire for wealth. Well, it so happened that he, little wealth that he had, he lost it. So once he met a merchant, a rich man, and so he narrated his story to him, and he said, I think you've forgotten, but Sri Krishna grants liberation. It's Durga Maya that you should worship if you desire wealth. So he took the deity of Sri Krishna and set it aside, and he placed the deity of Durga Maya on his altar, and he offered dhup incense. So the fragrance of the dhup, it was 
flowing towards Sri Krishna. So he got really upset and he said, he doesn't want to give me anything. But he just likes stealing this fragrance, contaminating it that I'm offering to Durga Maya. So he took Rui, cotton wool, and he stuffed it in the nose of Sri Krishna. So instantly Sri Krishna appeared and said, Varam Bruhi, Varamango. Ask for a boon, my child. So he said, I will ask for a boon later, but please tell me now how, what happened that you appeared before me? I have been worshiping you for so many years. So Sri Krishna said, yes, that is true. You've been worshiping me for so many years, but you've been worshiping me as a deity, a lifeless deity made of stone that the Shilpis, you know, thok baja ke apna naak, kaan, aak, muh bana dete hain. They make the, the, you know, the deity. They carve the stone into the form of a deity, the Shilpis. So you've been worshiping me like that, just lifeless, static. So I remained lifeless for you. But today I appeared before you because you believed that I was stealing that fragrance. The dhup, the incense, and that is why you stuffed my nose. So with this feeling that they are really and truly in front of us with this faith, we have to remember them and do their rup dhyan. And with religious and diligent practice when we diligently practice this sadhana then what will happen is that our worldly desires and our ambitions and our trishna and our vasana and everything will begin to recede will begin to diminish and our love for Sri Radha Krishna will begin to grow it will begin to multiply it will begin to increase our heart will become purified that is what will happen with the grace of our Guru and Sri Radha Krishna. There's one more point that I would like to discuss, which is that sometimes devotees, after having practiced devotion for so many years, they feel that they have not made any significant progress on the path of devotion. There are feelings of discouragement, disheartenment. They feel that they haven't made any progress there is an incident in the life of Madhusudan Saraswati which I'd like to share with you although some of you may have heard Madhusudan Saraswati was a great scholar and he was the follower of Shankaracharya so he used to go to various places and challenge others in scriptural debates and defeat them so once he met a saint and the saint asked him, so do you feel happy when you win a debate? And he said, of course, yes, I do. Do you feel unhappy when you don't win a debate? And he said, yes. So the saint said that you're oscillating between the states of happiness and sadness. You propagate the philosophy of Advait, of non-dualism, but you haven't reached that state yourself. You're still under the clutches of uh, these two states of um, happiness and sorrows. So it opened the eyes of Madhusudan Saraswati, he was shocked at hearing the statement of the saint. So he asked him, well, what should I do? So Madhusudan, the saint said, you should practice devotion to Sri Krishna. Go to Vrindavan and do sadhana over there. Do practice of devotion over there. So Madhusudan Saraswati did. He went to Vrindavan and for three years he did sadhana there. But three years later, when he did not receive the vision of Sri Krishna, he became disappointed, he gave up, he lost hope, and he started to return. And as he was returning, 
he saw another saint sitting under the tree, a tree. So the saint said, you've given up already. Madhusudan Saraswati asked, well, how do you know? Well, he said, I know many things. So Madhusudan Saraswati said, yes, I practiced for so long and I did not receive the vision of Sri Krishna. So I don't think it's going to work. So I'm going back. So the saint said, well, how about if I introduce to a ghost? Do you want to see a ghost? I can teach you the practice of uh, how you can meet this ghost. So Madhusudan Saraswati said, well, I haven't seen Sri Krishna. Well, maybe, sure. Uh, I, could, I could give it a shot. <laughs> so <laughs> the saint taught him. And he practiced this sadhana for a year. But a year later, he did not receive even the vision of the ghost. So he started to go back. And then Madhusudan Saraswati, again, he saw the saint who asked him, what happened? So he said, I did not succeed. So the saint, he called the ghost there and asked him so the ghost said I, you know I tried many times but his aura was so extremely strong that I couldn't go anywhere near him so Madhusudan Saraswati realized that the devotion the sadhana that he did actually had effect on him it had he did receive the benefit although he did not realize so he went back again upon the instructions of the saint. He went to Rindavan and he did sadhana there for another three years near the, there's a mandir called Radha Govind Mandir in Rindavan. And uh, finally, when he received when Sri Krishna appeared before him to give his darshan, something unusual happened. Madhusudan Saraswati, he turned his face away. He refused to look at Sri Krishna. So Sri Krishna asked, well, why are you so dejected? What happened? So Madhusudan Saraswati asked, How, why did it take you so long? What took you so long to come to me? So Sri Krishna showed him a mountain of his sins. He said, look at all these sins. Sanchit Pap. The accumulated sins of our past uncountable lifetimes. He gave him a little glimpse of that. So, the point is that we have all of that against us. As devotees, we have to Keep trying and not get discouraged or disheartened because that is against surrender. There's a story of a Hindu who converted to Islam. So the Malvi, he told the man, that now you have to utter the name of Allah from now on. No more Ram, no more Sham. So he said, of course. Now that I have become a Muslim, I will only utter the name of Allah. So when he awoke the next morning, while yawning, he said, Oh, Ram. He forgot that he had become a Muslim. So the Malvi, he chided him. And uh, he said, uh, Why are you saying Ram? Have you, did you forget your promise? The promise that you made yesterday? So the man replied, he said, Oh Malvi Sahib, Ram has resided in my heart 
for 42 years. Allah only just came yesterday. Allah just came yesterday. So how can I forget Ram so quickly? So in the same way, we have been so involved in the world, in our life after life after life, in our past so many lifetimes, even in this lifetime. Our desires are so deep-rooted, so we have to do our sadhana, our bhakti, diligently, faithfully, and little by little, we will keep making progress in the direction of our goal of God-realization. That is what we have to do. Rup Dhyan. To conclude my lecture, I want to share with all of you that in 2005, when Sri Maharaji came to the United States for the first time to this ashram, Radha Madhav Dham. It was his last day, the day that Sri Maharaji was farewelled, and he gave graced us all with a farewell message. And he said that in the past few weeks, the seva that I have done to all of you, I want something from all of you in the form of Dakshina. In other words, Sri Maharaji asked us how fortunate we are, how blessed we are, that he asked us to reciprocate the fruits of the seva, the service that he gave to us. And what did he ask for? That we all do remembrance, that we all do rubdhyan as many times as possible throughout the day. That was his Agya. And it wasn't like Sri Maharaji has, he only gave us that Agya in, in, in 2005. Sri Maharaji has repeatedly, hundreds and thousands of times, emphasized the importance of Rup Dhyan. He has urged us repeatedly. Even as I speak to you now, he's telling us to do Rup Dhyan. That is always Sri Maharaji's message. That is always his wish for us. That we would embrace, accept, adopt this sadhana, this intensive is a true representation of the benevolent grace of Sri Maharaji. All of us on this intensive have f 
felt uplifted, elevated, inspired, who have experienced tears, goosebumps, thrill. In so many ways, Sri Maharaji has served us repeatedly throughout this intensive on the basis of our inner urge, on the basis of our inner desire, the devotional desire. He has served each and every one of us tirelessly. So, Today being the last day of the intensive, let us all take this message from Sri Maharaji to do Rupthyan. Let us all reciprocate the hard work that Sri Maharaji spent years and years inspiring us and guiding us, propelling us on this path of devotion. And he will continue forever to inspire us and to uplift us and to guide us individually, each and every one of us. So let us all firmly make this commitment, lock this message in our heart and mind, treasure it, cultivate it, live it. And when we will do this sadhana, as per his divine agya and instructions, we could not make him more happy. He would be so extremely happy and we would be so gratified. And when we will perfect the sadhana of Rubdhyan, then that will be the day when we would have become exclusive and single-minded. The only desire in our heart would be the desire for Sri Radha Krishna and their eternal servitude. Boli Jagat Guru Shri Kripalu Ji Maharaj Ki Shri Raseshwari Radha Rani Ki Jai Jai Shri Radhe Jai Jai Shri Radhe Jai Jai Shri